Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to week eight. Last time we spoke, you had an assignment due, and now you don't have anything due. Um, well, except assignment two, but like you don't have anything for assignment one due. So you've done a whole assignment. That's super exciting. First assignment of the course, done and dusted. Good job. Um, how's everyone's weekend been? Did people have an okay weekend? Yeah? I mean, not that you could do much. I uh, I live in the Canterbury Bankstown area, so um, we're constantly waiting here for the world to explode. Apparently, um, <clears throat> did a hackathon. Awesome, cool. Finally sick of lockdown. Rebecca's finally sick of it. <laughs> it's like, all right, it's given me um, it's given me that break from people I want, but now it's gone too far. I was just saying this in 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 a tute for another course as um. I think the scary thing about this lockdown is I don't think they're going to keep the hard rules forever. You know, like for a long time, like the whole you can only leave the house once, one person and all of that. But I feel like it's going to be quite a while till like the masks indoors and the social distancing stuff is less. But I hope that's not true. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was a few months of that, which is kind of a shame. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit of a shame for T3 actually because... I think there's there's a bit up in the air at the moment about what's going to happen with T3 and um, everything like that. So, two quick things before we start. Um, number one, number one, um, I'm sorry that I'm wearing this. It's just really cold today, <laughs> and I don't know why it's so cold in my room, but it is really cold today. So. Thank you for putting up with me in that. And the second thing is, I just got an email from CSE SOC um, about <clears throat> um, a Capture the Flag competition this weekend, uh, Friday, well, Friday till Saturday afternoon. I will post this information up as a notice. Uh, I just won't send an email to everyone. So, yeah. This, the details, the link will all be on WebCMS3. But if you're interested in that, check it out. It's all on Facebook. You probably get notified of this if you're on social media and stuff. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of it. Um, and Kenneth says, why haven't my lab marks? Why haven't my lab marks shown for Lab Seven? Um, I mean, that's probably a question for your. Check that within your tweet this week, and if, if you still issues, post on the forum. Okay, so this week, we are talking about sorting. Um, and for some reason, I don't know why, but whenever I think about 2521, I always think about two things. Two things always come to my head, and that's binary trees, and that's sorting. I have no idea why it's those two things in particular, but it is. And... Today we're touching on one of those two things, which is sorting. Um, are the slides messed up? Oh no, I hope they're okay. Anyway, um, so what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be talking about sorting generally, like what is sorting, different properties of it conceptually. We're going to talk about the basic sorts, of which we've already done a third of these because we talked about bubble sort back in week two. And then we're going to talk about two harder types of sorts, which are merge sort and quick sort. They're harder to understand, but they're also a lot faster when they execute. So there's some, some pluses there, which is good. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about some summaries of sorting. And then we might, we're probably going to talk about assignment three sometime either today or tomorrow as well. Just because, um, yeah, with assignment three, uh, Assignment two, sorry, part three of assignment two. That's what I meant to say. We do want to talk about part three of assignment two just a little bit uh, in the next day, whether today or on Thursday. It doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, everyone's freaking out when I said assignment three. So let's get stuck into sorting first. So let's talk about an overview of sorting. Um, <laughs> assignment three. Yeah, so panic, death. Yeah, assignment three. It's the one we release in week 10 that's due in week 11, right? Okay, so let's talk about sorting. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about sorting because 
I mean, why, like, why do we sort numbers? Isn't that a very philosophical question? Uh, a common reason to sort numbers are because you want to see what they look like sorted. Um, or perhaps you want to find some interesting meaning, like you want to find a median value or a minimum value or a maximum value. That's one benefit of sorting. Uh, the other benefit of sorting, which we've talked about a lot to date, is that when you sort lists of numbers, it can actually help you speed up searching because a lot of searching algorithms can perform better, such as binary search, when the numbers you have are sorted. So hopefully the value of sorting is kind of clear and we don't need to go into too much depth about that. But at the fundamental level, sorting is something that you can do on an ordered list of items, an ordered collection of items. So on a computer, you have things like linked lists and arrays, which have a sense of order in them. Um, not all data structures have a sense of order in them. For instance, graphs don't have a sense of order. There's no real sense of which node comes before this node or which edge comes before that edge. They're all just kind of a, a, a pool of stuff. Whereas sorting is something that we can apply to collections of items that are sortable or they're orderable. And maybe that orderable collection of items that are yet to be ordered and our job is to order it. So um, typically when we do this, we're doing it either in ascending or descending order. There's only really two ways to sort, either one direction or the other. So, and you know this, if you've got numbers, you can either sort them from the lowest to the highest or the highest to the lowest um, of something, you know. And if you have a collection of words, say, you know, all the words on these slides, you could put these into a list and sort them. You could sort them based on the words that are more alphabetically high come first and the words that are more alphabetically low come first to last. Or you could sort them by the size of the string or you could sort them by the number of vowels in the string. Like whatever that thing is, generally all types of sorting we do are sorting an orderable collection of stuff from lowest to highest or highest to lowest of some particular discriminant, you know, size, number, whatever. Um, yeah, as we said, typically you'll sort numbers numerically, you'll sort characters alphabetically. Um, yeah, Megagrog says alphabetically sort the words on your essay before you submit it. Exactly. That'll make it easier to understand. The big problem we're dealing with, um, or what we call the sorting problem is just this idea that we have, and if you just humor it at the start as an array, that we have this array of, of orderable but unordered items and we want to sort a part of that array um, to be ordered from that point forward. So you see we've got this function here, sort a low high. Now what, what, what does that mean, sort a low high? Well what this is saying is that we would like to sort an array a from a low index to a high index. So if you, if we say just like let's open, let's open some um, random file, call it sort.c, right? Um, you know, and you might have a really simple program, a simple main function, and it's just got some array, an integer array of five items, uh, five, three, four, one, two, like this, and you'd like to sort these. And so when we talk about this g general sort call, function call, we give it the array or the pointer to the array. We give it the index we want to start sorting from and the index we want to finish sorting to. Basically the bounds of the array we're interested in sorting. And then this sort function looks, you know, something like, um, looks something like this, right? Int, int star a, int low, int high, like that. And then it does stuff. Um, and I mean, that's probably not... Like, let's see if this is a valid program. I've probably done something wrong. Okay, well, that was easy. There you go. There's, there's a C program that sorts, and it doesn't really do anything because you can see it just, like, does nothing with the, the numbers. If we tried to print them out after, it would, you know, it would fail. Um, but that's what you're seeing here on the slides because we have this general sort function Think of it like an ADT, it's an abstract idea. You know what it takes in, you know what it does for you, but you don't know how it works. It doesn't matter how it works because the behavior is what you want, which is to sort the numbers. And you might be thinking, okay, well, why do we need the low and the high thing here? Why can't we just pass in the size of the array? 
right? Like all arrays start at zero, so why don't we just pass in the, you know, um, size of the array. By the way, this should be a one, I'm sorry. That should be n minus one. Um, and the answer is because, as you'll see this particularly in the latter parts of sorting that we do, sometimes when you call sorting algorithms, you don't actually want it to sort the entire array. You actually sometimes want to sort like a subarray or something similar. Sometimes you only want to sort between two and four, for instance, you know, but we can start off with like zero to four and then we could try and print those out, right? Like let's just hash define a, let's, um, let's hash include iOS, let's hash include studio.h, let's hash define the size as five, We'll just put this here and then we'll do a really quick for loop to print them out, right? Um, like this, and then we can just print f uh, percent d space and then give it ai and then we'll print f a new line like that. And there's our, our really simple program that is missing a semicolon. Um, and then let's just, let's just make sure we're doing it properly. Let's compile with wall and where are Great. You can see it doesn't sort anything. Perfect. That's exactly what we want. How would we sort? That's the real question. That's the question we're trying to tackle today, which we'll come back to. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the theory first. So firstly, some preconditions of this sorting function are that the low and the high are all valid indexes. High is not the size of the list or the object you're dealing with. It is these are pointing to indexes. So low and high are always valid indexes of the array. Um, and the idea is that when you sort on a subset of the array, say between low here and high here, when you finish sorting, all of those numbers are the same. They're just in a different order. They're not like if you if you pull all those numbers out and you put them into a set, the two sets would be identical, um, but the order is different. So that's the other precondition is that it contains the same set of values after, and that's one of the post conditions. Um, and the other post condition is that for all the numbers or all the values I should say between those two indexes they are now sorted such that you know the one on the left is smaller than the one next to it etc this is assuming like it's an ascending list obviously if it was a descending list it would kind of be the opposite idea um, and typically speaking a lot of algorithms that we not all of them but a lot of algorithms that we're going to be doing sorting with do what we call sorting in place, which is essentially that when you write algorithms, you can generally do things by using a new data structure where say you have, uh, you know, say we have this list over here of items and they're out of order to sort them. We could go and make a new data structure and we could simply, you know, put this one here and then put this one here and put this one here and put this one here and we could move everything down. And then once we're happy that this is a new sorted list, we could just like, copy that all across again, right? So we could kind of have this temporary array where we move things to and we get the happy and then we can just sort it back, <coughs> move it back up. Um, but that requires extra memory and a lot of the sorting algorithms that we're working with do what we call an in-place sort, which is where they don't need extra memory. And a lot of that is based on the idea that if you have these, you know, uneven, these non-sorted lists, you know, something like this, <coughs> that when you actually do the sorting, often it's based on the idea of you're going to be swapping numbers. And a lot of, a lot of sorts really just uh, have this idea of swapping. In fact, four out of the five sorts we're looking at are just swapping numbers. And then it's really all about how are you swapping those numbers that creates the different kinds of sorts. So a lot of these algorithms are in place. And often we start at the left-hand side and we try and move slowly across to the right-hand side um, and this diagram, I think, is a little bit confusing or deceiving, but it's like generally with these sorting algorithms, you start at one side and you just slowly make your way across and you try and sort everything in that way. And most sorting algorithms will have a thing where as it's being sorted, like there's like a part of it that's sorted and that part kind of grows out. Though um, different algorithms do do these things in different ways. Two really important properties of sorting algorithms that we need to keep in mind when we sort is the stability and the adaptability of a sort. So a stable sort, firstly, is a sort that maintains orders for duplicates. And what that means is that if we're rearranging numbers, that duplicates stay in the same order. 
Um, and if we look at something like this, right, and I replace these numbers with, say, you know, 3, 5, 5, 2, 2, you could kind of imagine that, you know, this 5 here is, call this red 5, and this 2 here is called red 2, and then this 5 here is called green 5, and this 2 here is called green 2. And what a stable sort guarantees us is that when we sort these, and let me just like sort them for you now, that when we sort these, that it maintains their relative order. So what I mean by that is like, let's say we take these fives here, where are these fives going to end up in a sorted list? Well, they're going to end up like over here kind of thing, right? Um, and then, you know, the, the two is going to end up, or the three I should say is going to end up in the middle. Um, probably is, doesn't really matter. So, you know, we'll have the three will end up over here and then the twos will end up at the front. But the point is that the relative order of the duplicates has stayed the same. Such that, you know, red was before the green one and red was before the green one. And therefore you end up with something like this. So this is what you call a stable sort. If it does this for all inputs, then it's what you call a stable sort because it maintains the order of duplicates. Um, and the formal definition, right, is that if x equals y, if x precedes y in an unsorted list, then x precedes y in a sorted list. So it doesn't mean that the green and red don't have to be next to each other. You could have the, you know, the green could be, could be over here or something, right? And you could have, you know, like a, a four here. Um, it just means that this, this red two always needs to stay left of that green two. Blake says, I imagine this is useful when you're sorting things like structs that contain more than just what you're sorting by. Yeah, exactly. So when we look at things like, um, I think, I think a great way to understand sorting is that a lot of the sorting we do in this course is by, we look at numbers, where like we're sorting numbers. And in reality, you do sort numbers, you know, that's a thing you do. But it's best to understand the numbers as a representation of the order of something bigger. You know, so for instance, like if you do have a struct and that struct consists of, say, a name, an age, and a date of birth, this number might represent the age of someone or the date of birth of someone, um, but there's often other information that's hiding under the surface, you know. So for instance, um, what's a really crappy example I can think about? It's like, you know, imagine these represent the ages of customers that you have, three, five, five, two four and two, and then these fell into this list, these fell into this array based on when they signed up, right? So say you had people sign up, this person signed up and that person signed up and, and so forth. And let's say you want to sort it so that you know when to actually like, um, you know, kind of call these people up to congratulate them for their, their, you know, sixth birthday or something. You know, when they all turn six, you want to, you want to just have this nice list so you can just keep track of it and just like call them up and say happy birthday and it's like if you want to make sure for instance that the people that signed up first get wished happy birthday first or get that call first or get that bonus first um, then a stable sort matters a lot to you because it essentially means that even though there were duplicates at the start they, the ordering meant something to you you know like when all these different thing you know people um, with the same value or the same discriminant value for sorting came in, it's like you cared about the order in which they came in. So therefore you want to preserve it. Um, uh, would you identify red and green by address or how would you identify them? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. Would you identify them by address? I mean, we'll, we'll get into this with sorting, but typically stable sorts, the thing that, the thing that makes them stand out is they simply just don't bother to sort duplicates. Um, and you'll actually see, like, this This actually is true for bubble sort, I think, which is the sort we looked at in week two, where we just, like, swap everything. It's like, if a bubble sort comes across a two and a two, it's just not going to swap them. It's like, why would I swap them? They're the same number. And if this two came before this two, they're never going to get swapped, and therefore the order's always maintained. So often, often stability is is not really about tracking stuff. It, it's often just about the design of the algorithm just means that we're not going to bother sort, you know, swapping things around, we don't need to. But again, that varies per algorithm, and we'll continue to talk about that. Um, uh, yeah, Hamish said, e.g., sorting your W frequencies in assignment one. 
You might sort by frequency and it's already in lexicographical order. A stable sort would then sort by frequency, then lexicographic. Yeah, so that's a good point. So like, yeah, let's say in assignment one, you had a whole bunch of things like you had, you know, five was, um, you had five instances of apple and you had eight instances of, um, you know, banana and, you know, six instances of, Eight, and like five instances of, of carrot, right? And eight instances of danger. Um, the benefit of a stable sort here, right, is that if you stably sort these, you're going to get five apple, five carrot, eight banana, eight danger, because the, the relative order of duplicates is maintained. So if you already made sure that this list is sorted alphabetically at the start, then a stable sort will actually maintain that alphabetical sorting within the bucketing. So, you know, when, when this ends up, it's like, you know, when this finishes sorting, um, all the things with the same frequency will actually still be sorted as you intended for them to be originally, which is alphabetical. In my experience, a lot of the time, sorts that aren't stable don't really destroy things. They don't really like blow up things, though um, what they do do is prevent like... If you have a stable sort, often it means you definitely don't have to go and like rehandle things. Like if if you were using a sort that wasn't stable, then you would just have to, you know, for each little bucket of frequencies, you just have to sort those. But it's like it's not the end of the world, but it's certainly an inconvenience. Um, yeah. So that's what a stable sort is. An adaptive sort is when the performance or you know think of it like the time complexity or the big o notation of a sort is affected by the values of the items themselves um and we've seen this before right when we talked about our first kind of sort which is a, a bubble sort is that if you use a bubble sort on a list that's fully sorted already it just kind of goes through it checks all if you if you don't remember about bubble sort i'd suggest you pause the video and go watch week two again but like it just looks at all the pairs and if they're in the right order it just says i'm done and we learned that was that the time complexity of bubble sort was n, um, and the time complexity of like the time complexity of bubble sort for a sorted list was n. I don't know if we wrote much down. It was more of an exploration thing. Did we do it? Where was it? That was for sum. That was for sort. Yeah, so in the best case of bubble sort, it was n. Um, and in the worst case of bubble sort, it was n squared. Basically, the best case does not equal the worst case. And that's because it depends on the values. Like, you say, well, what's the time complexity? Well, the answer is what, what depends on what the input is. So in those cases, they're what we call adaptive sorts because the time complexity and the performance adapts to the actual value of the items. And again, typically the, the giveaway for whether something's adaptive or not is when you see that the best average and worst case aren't all the same. Or more specifically, when the best and the worst case aren't the same, then you're like, this is probably an adaptive sort. Uh, yeah, it depends essentially. So this is just also a bit of a recap. Um, when we look at sorting complexity, uh, typically when we talk about best case and worst case and average case, the, the three types of things we look at are usually um, random order, sorted order, and reverse order. So the, the assumption is that if we, if, we look at, if we analyze our algorithm with a sorted list, then that gives us our best case. If we analyze it with a reverse sorted list, that gives us our worst case. And then if we analyze it with a random list, that gives us our average case. Uh, often the average case is the same as the worst case. This isn't always true because certain algorithms might behave better on badly sorted lists um, or reverse sorted lists or, or you know something like that. So it's just something you need to keep your mind on. Um, when you do look at the algorithms, the one thing that really determines the complexity, the one thing that really... Um, you know, m tells you what the big O notation is, is fundamentally just about the number of comparisons and the number of swaps between items. Like, if you think back to a bubble sort, which we looked at again, it's like a bubble sort is just a whole series of pairwise checks and swaps, 
that's what a bubble sort is. Um, a fast sorting algorithm does as few of those as possible. And there are two general types of time complexities that you'll see in the sorting space, um, which are n squared and, and n log n. Now, we'd love to get this faster, but without any pre-work, without any um, kind of setup or caching or anything crazy, you just taking a list you've never seen before and sorting it will never be on. It's just not like mathematically possible. Um, it'll either be n log n in the best case or it'll be n squared in the worst case. And they're the two types of complexities you're going to see from algorithms that we're talking about this week. They're either going to be complexity of n squared or they're going to be complexity of um, n log n. Now on that topic, um, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of our um, uh, you know, pseudocode, or this isn't even pseudocode, this is actual code. And I kind of started doing this before, but I'm just pulling up VLAB again. But like, more specifically, more specifically, you know, this is kind of code representing how we'd actually be dealing with things, right? Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, when you're sorting, We have our sort function, which I've already written. We have a swap macro, which can be really useful um, to swap two items so we don't have to like overthink it. Um, and then we have a type def for the item that we're sorting, which in this case might be like an int. So we can complicate our example a little bit. And then the last thing we have here is an is sorted function. Now, an is sorted function just goes through, um, just trying to see what. How does this work? I think I, there we go, if not less. So what a is sorted function does is basically like it verifies whether or not our list is sorted. So for instance, here I could say, you know, assert um, is sorted, or I could maybe not assert it, but like I'll just say printf uh, percent %d percent %d uh, is sorted, and then I'll give it a 0 and 4 like that. So we'll actually print out whether it's sorted or not here, and hopefully this works. Um, oh, I'm just going to use, let's just use ones and zeros, and we'll use ones and zeros. We could we could include standard bool.h, but this is simpler. Okay, so zero means it's not sorted, right? So it's not sorted, and we want to sort it. Uh, so it's, that's some really basic code. So all the sorts we're dealing with today can all be done from this as a basis where you simply have to fill in the actual sorting algorithm that takes in a high and a low. Now, what we'll do just before this is let's implement a bubble sort again, just so you can wind your head back into it. Bubble sort's technically part of the next lecture, but we've already talked about it, so we don't need to go into excessive depth in it. Um, I just want to get you thinking about it again. So... If you remember, a bubble sort was that sort that took... Um, it just went through your list pairwise until it thought it sorted everything, right? So it, it you know, it took it looked at this pair, and if they're in the wrong order, it swapped them. And then it moved to the next one, and then it moved to the next one, and then it moved to the next one. So it was two loops. And that's where we got that n squared from, right? So we had our... Um, we had something like we were like, uh, n sorted equals zero. Um, in fact, you've kind of motivated me now to include standard bool. So I'll, I'll use standard bool. So we start off saying sorted as false. I'll just change some of these too. See if this still compiles. Doesn't compile. Now, actually, just, just, just a random thing. This has been on my mind a bit the last few days. Um, but sometimes I see people like... They'll post in the forum and stuff, and they'll be like, my code my code isn't working, like it's not compiling, or like it's crashing. And like a question I always, or not always, but I always think about, but sometimes ask is just the question, well, when was it, when was it working? I mean, not, you know, like as in, I doubt you've written 300 lines of, I doubt you've written 300 lines of code, and it's now just suddenly stopped working. Um, so at some point it was working, even if it was just a main function, and then... It stopped working after that. So it's like, where was that point where it stopped working? And the 
like sometimes students will be like, I don't know, like it's, it's, I just don't know. And a lot of the reason that happens is because sometimes it's really easy to get carried away writing code and we kind of forget to keep checking things as we write. So just as a general piece of advice, and I know many of you are aware of this already, is like your, one of your biggest priorities should be at a minimum to compile your code extremely regularly and then run your code ideally as regularly as that. Um, and you always want to just start in small chunks because the thing is, if your code breaks and you don't know why, you're pretty much going to get, you're pretty much going to get someone to be able to help you immediately. If you're like, okay, so I had this code and then I literally added these three lines and it didn't do what I expected, you know, and that's the landscape you're now working with. So there's actually a huge benefit to working in the smallest chunks possible, just in terms of getting help and support. So I've got my sorted array here and, and we're going to follow the standard um, bubble sort approach, which is while it's not sorted, um, we set sorted as true and then we um, go through all the elements. So for int i equals zero or i equals low, I guess, technically, um, while i is less than i minus one because whenever you're comparing pairs you always want to go one less than the end and then i plus plus and we'll see if this works see this is what i mean like stop here like literally stop i'm not done but like stop does it compile does it run still runs doesn't work right but it's still like now i know that all this is fine and it just it de-stresses the brain quite substantially and, it, and then we do a check we say if a of i is greater than a of i plus one um, then we want to swap them. We'll swap a of i and a of i plus one, and that should that should work. Whenever we swap them, though, that's us. That's telling us that the array isn't sorted yet. So then we have to set sorted as false, and that's the that's the standard bubble sort algorithm that that you know we've dealt with previously, and it doesn't work. I've done it wrong. What have I done wrong here? Someone will. There's a problem with the high. I feel like I feel like I don't need the minus one here, because normally this is the size of the list, whereas high is technically the last index. And the reason that normally you'd say like i is less than size here, but because in this case high is like just the last index, I don't think we like normally you'd say size minus one, but since since um high is the actual minus one, right? We don't need that. And therefore this should probably work for us. Okay. So now we've sorted our, we've done a bubble sort. Great. Now everything else we do today is just going to be a different kind of sort here. So I hope that's given a good overview of sorting. Um, this is actually a separate lecture. So if you could spare a moment to give feedback, that would be great. I'll just leave this up for 10, 10 or 20, 30 seconds. If anyone has any last questions about sorting as an overview, please let me know. Otherwise, we're going to jump into the basic sorts that exist. Be any, any last questions on this before we dig deeper? Cool. All right. I'm just going to wait another sec. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you.